broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. Christmas is a season where so many people go into debt. It starts with Black Friday sales, and it ends with the Christmas Eve rush to buy those last-minute gifts. Then Christmas morning, the kids tear open the gifts, play with them for five minutes, and then go back to their old toys, leaving behind a whole mess of wrapping paper for you to pick up and future credit card bills. ABC News reported that consumer counseling agencies see a 25% increase in the number of people seeking help in January and February. Most of that is propelled by holiday bills that haunt consumers like the ghost of Christmas past. For some people, those bills... That rain sounds so good. I love that sound. Then the thunder, a little bit of thunder out there too. That's wonderful. For some people, those bills are for, from uh, Christmas past. And they struggle just to, to pay that minimum amount while they're just racking up more and more debt. And if that's you, if you are prone to use your credit card as if it were cash, um, you can go online and you can tithe with your credit card. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Just a joke. Disregard that. We'll edit that out. It's, it's been said that more Americans are in debt these days than ever before, and many lay the blame for that on credit cards. Though the cards, they don't charge themselves, right? People use the cards. Unless you've been hacked, you will never receive a pre-declined credit card in the mail. And a shredded credit card will never be accepted at the checkout counter. The prevalence of plastic has made it easier than ever for people to to spend. And it's easier than ever to put off paying the bill. The problem with credit is that it's spending money which you actually don't have. It's as if a person can reach forward into their future wallet to purchase what they want now. The problem is that even if a person is disciplined enough to pay off all of that debt, the future isn't always what we expect and often doesn't feature a full wallet. Those who do have that discipline don't know what's coming tomorrow, right? So when we're spending that that money on the credit cards, We could be setting ourselves up for something that uh, could be a big fall. Those who don't have discipline enough or, or means enough to pay for the credit card bill, they either convince themselves that somehow they will be able to pay the bill or that they can get away with not paying. So we find two ways of thinking. Buy now, pay later, and I won't have to pay. Most people wouldn't admit to that second way of thinking, but surveys show that it's a prevalent way of thinking among many who overextend themselves on credit. I tear up all the credit card applications that we get in the mail, and I'm always amazed at how many they are. I would guess that we get probably about eight or nine a week in the mail. It may actually be more than that. I don't know. But I know it's a big pile once I've done all the tearing. And it's no wonder then that people rack up astronomical debt. 
And credit card debt has become such a problem that today it takes someone an average of 20 years to pay off just one credit card debt. And with all that debt, it's not surprising that many lending agencies have sprung up, which are devoted to decreasing one's debt. Some offer to consolidate your bills for you. Others might suggest a low interest loan to, to pay off your bills, which essentially means going further into debt to pay off your debt. And if you're a homeowner, some lenders encourage you to tap into your home's equity in order to pay off those cards. Many people who are in credit card debt find themselves in a state of denial. They have cash to buy groceries, and they have the 4K Super Home Theater TV, so they can ignore the bills because they find themselves satisfied. It doesn't hit them until the creditors start calling, and then they find themselves frustrated and depressed over this debt that is too large for them to fathom. How did I get this deep into debt? They may ask themselves. They say they've made a terrible mistake, but credit card debt is not something that just happens accidentally. Realistically, it's earned. And that's the tie-in to our chapter today. After spending some weeks in, in Romans, chapters 1, 2, and 3, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that there is a great spiritual debt which all people have earned. Up to this point, Paul has given us a wake-up call reminding us that we are all spiritually in dire straits. And while the wages of credit card debt is frustration and poverty, the wages of sin is death. In chapter 1, Paul told us that the unbelieving would, would stand guilty before God. In chapter 2, Paul told us that those who think that they are good and those who think they can prove they are good are just as guilty before God as unbelievers. Their mouths will be unable to make any case for their goodness before God. Even God's chosen and special people are guilty. In the original languages of Scripture, in the Hebrew and the Greek, we find that all means all. And so when Paul states that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it really does mean all. And although there are earthly consequences for sin, there are far more frightening eternal consequences. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, that eternal consequences of sin are much more monumental than what can happen to us on earth. That's not to say that sin does not have terrible consequences here. But greater than that is the horror of an eternity in hell. It's a great time. <laughs> Dramatic pause. So people should be very concerned about sin debt. It's a debt that is common to all people. Every person is born owing God. And this debt increases throughout our lives as sin increases more and more. The problem is that all of those sins, our failure to love God first, our failure to love one another, all of these sins are credited to our accounts. It's as if God did a, a credit check on each one of us and found that we've all fallen short. We are buried under a load of sin. The interest rate of guilt forces us to fall even deeper into spiritual debt. We're spiritually bankrupt and we know it. The guilt we feel causes us to loathe ourselves, to become depressed, and to despair. As it is, we are so desperate to try to get out from underneath this debt of sin that we'll try anything. And so we, fool, we, we devise foolish payment plans of our own. We approach God as if He was a lender, saying that He should give us grace on loan, promising, hey, we'll pay you back. We fool ourselves into thinking that we can earn God's grace and somehow pay off this debt of sin on our own, through our own efforts. The Jews looked at Abraham as a shining example of someone who was right 
with God. They argued that if anybody had a clean credit score, a clean credit history with God, Abraham did. His life was full of righteous works. Though he had moments of disobedience, overall he obeyed God. So then he must have earned the right to be forgiven. And if Abraham could earn the right to be forgiven, then they must also be able to earn the right. To top it off, they were Abraham's descendants. They were the chosen people of God. Theirs was the equivalent of a preferred world MasterCard with rewards and bonus points and mileage. Since they were Abraham's descendants, they must have an outstanding credit history. We've all racked up an exorbitant debt before God. God runs a lending agency of his own. Only he doesn't necessarily take care of high spending on credit cards or home improvement projects. God takes care of the ultimate debt. And he offers us the ultimate credit advance. Our Lord absorbs the debt of the law and then offers the gift of salvation in its place. In chapter 3, Paul made two really important points. We're justified by faith, not works, and Jews and Gentiles alike have equal access to this justification. Now, in chapter 4, Paul expands on the point by using Abraham as an example by which he teaches us three very important things. By the example of Abraham, we will learn these three things and then then wrap up our chapter with four keys to faith. Now, those three things that we'll learn from Abraham are Abraham was justified by faith, not works. This is not an anomaly. It's the pattern of Scripture, and it's the means by which God saves people today by faith and not works. Secondly, we'll learn that Abraham was justified while still a Gentile. Abraham was not saved by privilege. The Jews, they are special to God, but all people stand before God the same. Salvation is apart from privilege. Third, God's promises are realized by faith, not by law keeping. Because we are unable to keep the law perfectly, the law cannot bring about perfection. Salvation is not by the keeping of the law. Now, the four key principles to faith, which we'll wrap up with, are these. First, ignore the human difficulty. Second, have simple trust in God. Third, act out your faith. And fourth, trust God no matter what. The goal of our study this morning is to recognize that God does not fulfill his promise through man's efforts but by grace through faith. The key verse for our study today is the second half of verse 17, which says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Let's start with verse 1 of chapter 4. And it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So we finished out chapter three last Sunday. And so today we're picking up here with chapter four. In reality, we began chapter four last week with verse Uh, with the last paragraph of chapter 3. That's because that last paragraph actually belongs to chapter 4. And in that last paragraph, Paul starts out with a question. And, and, well, actually he answers, he asks two questions in that last paragraph. One of those is, has the law somehow been nullified based on the exclusive role of faith and justification? Now he answers that question with a resounding no. He then begins chapter 4 with a question, and we might assume Paul is moving on to another topic, but he is actually building on 
the earlier argument, Paul is continuing his even earlier question of boasting from verse 27 of chapter 3. And he does so by using the example of Abraham. If he was justified by works, then why not boast in it? So in chapter 3, Paul made two very important points. Justified by faith, not by works, that Jews and Gentiles have equal access to this justification. Remember that justification means legal and formal acquittal from God, from guilt by God as judge. Put more simply, it means just as if you never sinned. So was Abraham justified by his obedience to God, or was it by grace through faith? This is the question that Paul is going to address by the practical case study of Israel's great patriarch, Abraham. The story of Abraham we find in Genesis chapters 11 through 25. You might want to write that reference down in your Bible next to where Paul begins to talk about Abraham in chapter 4. You may may actually want to go back and do your own little Bible study on it tonight before you go to bed, because we're not going to read through all those chapters but they are very important to what we are going to be studying today. Now, some people think Abraham or or Abram at that point, I'm probably swapped between the two. It's hard for me to keep those uh, in the right order. But Abram, Abraham, they're the same, same guy, was born. Some people think he was born with a halo around his head, and that's not the case. Abram was born a pagan with an idol maker for a father. He wasn't anyone special before God. He was just some guy. Now God said to Abraham, I want you. And Abraham said, okay. And that was it. Now as an indication of how the Jews believed Abraham was somehow righteous of himself, there is an extra biblical Midrashic story that speaks of Abraham originally discovering God rather than God calling Abraham. And we find the history of God calling Abraham and Abraham responding to God in chapter 15 of Genesis. We find written there that God appeared to Abram in a vision and told him not to be afraid, that God was his shield and very great reward. Abram asked God for an heir, and God said not only would he give him an heir, but that his offspring would be more numerous than the stars of heaven. And verse 6 of Genesis 15 says, And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, looking back at the story of Abraham, had Abraham done some great or fantastic work at this point? No. God made a promise, and Abraham just said, Okay, I believe you. Abraham hadn't done anything. He had no children of his own. In fact, in chapter 16, we find that Abram and his wife, Sarai, or Sarah, tried to produce God's promises out of their own flesh. You may remember Abraham impregnated Sarah's handmaiden in hopes that a son would be produced, which they would then call their own. Paul would later recognize in Galatians 4 that the child Ishmael produced from their own efforts and by a bondwoman in order to fulfill God's promise was a picture of the works of the law which can only produce bondage. God said, cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. God would not fulfill his promise through man's efforts, but by grace through faith. And God fulfilled his promise to Abraham exactly as he said he would, by Sarah. That child would be Isaac. And this picture is faith in God's fulfilling his promises. And it's all very simple. It's very, very simple. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, the fact that that God saves by faith rather than the keeping of the works of the law, this totally frees us up. 
You mean I can please God just by believing his promise? Yeah. You know, but like Abraham and Sarah, we can start to depend on works of the flesh instead of the simplicity of faith. To this, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So then very quickly, Paul points out here in Romans 4 that Abraham was justified by faith, not works. And this is not some anomaly in Scripture. It's the pattern of Scripture, and it's the means by which God saves people today by faith and not works. Adam and Eve were saved not by works, but by faith that God would would perform what he said he would. The patriarchs were not saved by their works, but by their faith in God. Salvation at that time, as it is now, is predicated upon Jesus' death and resurrection. Salvation is not of works. It never has been. It has always been by faith. There's nothing that man contributes to to his salvation. It's all of God, all of grace. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Does that mean that God lied to Israel by telling them to to perform sacrifices in order to atone for their sins? Absolutely not. Those sacrifices were all performed by faith, believing that what God said he would do, he would do. But those sacrifices were also pictures of the perfect sacrifice which is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So do we now offer sacrifices of works to earn salvation? Absolutely not. For that which was once only pictured is now come. And so we are saved today also by believing God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, there are only two kinds of religion in the world. I mean, you can list every ism you can think of, every religious system in the world, every cult in Southern California, (laughs) all the ologies of science and celebrities, And every scripturally deviant organization, you can place all those things and lump them under one category, which is do, do, and do. Only Christianity says done. Christ has done it all. So when we do works, believing that we are earning God's favor, we treat him as if he is a lender who will give us an extra 30 days to come up, come up with a payment. Jesus didn't proclaim from the, from the cross, 30 days, same as cash. He said paid in full. So instead of working to pay off our sin debt, we trust God. And that's it. You come to God. And say, I know, Lord, I can't please you on my own. But you say that Jesus died for my sins. And I will trust you. You see, that's what God's after. He doesn't create a system of do's and do nots, then offer us a lifetime in which to work harder to pay the bill. Instead, he wants us to trust him. To have a relationship with Him. That's why this grace that I proclaim to you this morning, that's why it is nothing short of amazing. Verse 5. Paul continues. He says, But to him who does not work but believes on Him and justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Righteousness. 
Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Paul there is quoting King David who wrote Psalm 32. In this psalm, David recognized that it is not those who are able to keep the law who are blessed. It's those who are unable to keep the law yet are saved by grace. David wrote in another psalm about this, in Psalm 103.12. He wrote, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The Lord will never count our sins against us if we are forgiven in Jesus Christ. I think there's a problem among Christians where they feel that because they've stumbled or because they have made a mistake, because they have failed, they are now indebted by sin. It's as if there's a, a bill that's coming, a bill that's, that, that's going to list their failures and it's going to imply or apply interest. There's a fear that God remembers it all, that he moves some beads on his sin-tallying abacus that he carries around whenever we fail, that he holds a grudge until the bill is paid. Then there's this possibility that there's going to come a day when you ask for something and, and God's going to say, you got to pay the bill first. There's that fear that, that God's gonna, gonna show up and pull down, you know, the, the screen and start showing you all the things that you've done wrong. All the times that you lied. All the times that you got mad. All the times that you stumbled according to the flesh. There's that fear that your credit score with God is going to take a hit and you will have you will not have enough grace points to, to pass. God doesn't work like that. Your sins are covered in Christ. He looks at you and sees the righteousness of His Son. It's been credited to you by faith. God doesn't see your sins anymore. And surely a deal like that must have some fine print, maybe a, a gotcha clause hidden somewhere among all the texts. Those who want to lay a burden across your back, they would say that all this is contingent on you upholding your side of the contract. They say that salvation comes about by Jesus plus some other thing. Maybe by, by keeping the law, or by baptism, by circumcision, or, 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 or by some penalty that you endure to be made right once again with God. You know, that was a continuing problem in the early church. Very early on, it was the Judaizers claiming that to be a real Christian, you had to be circumcised. Later, it became paying penances in a doctrine of purgatory. Even today, we find there to be man-made conditions applied to God-given grace, such as worshiping on the right day, having the right kind of worship music, or wearing the right clothes. But Paul demonstrates to us that according to Abraham and King David, it's not those who try to earn God's grace who are blessed, but those who receive it by faith. Jesus already bore the burden he already paid the price. God is not charging you interest against your sin. Verse 9, Paul continues. He says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then... Was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? 
not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life, to the dead and calls those things which do which do not exist as though they did. Paul's point. Paul's point here is that God counted Abraham righteous before he was circumcised. Circumcision was the sign of what God had promised. But that's all it was. Technically, then, Abraham was saved as a Gentile, not as a Jew. He did not enter Judaism by circumcision, nor did he have the law to keep. The law was not yet given. This should have been eye-opening to any Jew who maintained that one could not be saved without becoming a Jew by circumcision and keeping the law. But there are many today who believe that grace is conveyed by sacrament. Now, according to the clear teaching of Scripture, that's not the case. There's a modern day sign of God's promise. And it's baptism. Paul wrote of both circumcision and baptism in the letter to the Galatians. In chapter 3, he said, For you all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Baptism is the outward sign of an inward change. It's a work of obedience to Christ that comes after salvation. But unless salvation by grace through faith comes first, baptism has no value. It's an act of obedience to that all Christians should do, but it's not something that is unto salvation. Abraham believed God prior to receiving the badge of the covenant, and it was afterward that he was circumcised. Galatians 5.5 5 says, For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. God made his promise to Abraham 430 years before God delivered the law to Moses to take to Israel. Paul calls God the one that calls things that are not as though they were. We have a hard time understanding God because He lives in the eternal. God could talk to Abraham about Isaac as if Isaac were already born, even though Abraham and Sarah were not yet pregnant. Living in the eternal gives God a good perspective of your life Two, he knows where he's taking you. You may feel out of control, but he's not. 
Unlike a lender, God doesn't call you on your debt and send you into bankruptcy. Instead, God pulls you out of moral bankruptcy and gives you hope for tomorrow. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. We recognize now Paul's second point in regards to Abraham. That is, Abraham was justified while still a Gentile. Abraham was not saved by privilege. The Jews, they're special to God, but all people stand before God the same. Salvation is apart. It is separate from privilege. And while a human creditor may discriminate from person to person, the Bible says that God does not show favoritism. But He offers liberty from sin debt to all. But, you know, God does not only forgive. He cuts up the card so that you cannot rack up any more debt. Now, we call this plastic surgery at Financial Peace University. But spiritually, we might equate this to the circumcision of the heart. That is, a change of heart towards sin and toward God that can only come about by the work of the Holy Spirit. Zig Ziglar, author, salesman, motivational speaker. The sandwich meat is pretty good too. He said, I'm kidding about you. Uh, he said, on the planet Earth, there are many kinds of people. But in God's sight, there are only two kinds. Not rich or poor, old or young, tall or short, fat or thin, black or white, only saved or lost. In God's kingdom, the mighty and the humble join hands when all of them become the children of God. Verse 18. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham and Sarah were now far beyond their childbearing years. So outwardly, there was no reason why God's promise should come about. When God called Abraham out of Ur, he promised to make him a great nation. Yet the years had passed and God had been good to them but they were still without children. What God had promised seemed more and more unlikely as the years went by. Yet Abraham believed. Maybe what God has promised you seems more and more unlikely. Maybe it seems completely impossible. Jesus said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Seeking His will in our lives. He will bring it about if we trust Him. Maybe God's asking you to do something that seems impossible. You know what? It probably is. God likes to have His people do impossible things. And those who believe Him are rewarded by seeing those things happen. Not by our power, but by His. I like to think about it in this way. You know, I have two little boys, the youngest of which, you know, we accumulate a lot of trash in our house. And so, you know, if you were to fill up a trash bag with all the trash that gets accumulated in our house, I mean, it's like a yard bag, you know, it's a big trash bag. And if I was to go to Joshua and I was to say, Joshua, I need you to take out the trash. I want you to take out that trash. It would be kind of hard for him to take out that trash. It would be physically impossible. But what I could do as his father is I could pick him up in one arm and I could take that trash up in my other and I could carry out the trash, place it in the trash can, 
and then credit Joshua with doing the work. It's hard to understand, hard to, to comprehend that whole Romans 8, 28, 29 thing. That all things work together for good to those who love God. It's hard to, to understand how God makes, uh, establishes things in our life, how he establishes plans, how he fulfills promises when things seem so impossible. Yet he does. You know, and the cool thing about it we, we think about rewards. We think about, you know, rewards in heaven. And the problem with that is then, then that we can think, well, I've got to keep working, I've got to keep striving, whatever, because I want to build up rewards in heaven. When the reality is that God is carrying us in one arm, and He's doing the work in the other, and then He's rewarding us as if we did the work. God's promises, this is the third thing, God's promises are realized by faith, not by keeping the law. Because we are unable to keep the law perfectly, the law cannot bring about perfection. The law could not do what absolutely has to be done if we are to be rescued from the guilt of condemnation. The law could not justify us. It could not set us right with God. The law could not take away our guilt. It could not absorb our condemnation. It could not cancel our debt. What it did was show us our guilt and make us even more sinful by stirring up the rebellion of our flesh. Salvation is not by the keeping of the law. Faith is the only way of receiving God's blessing. Paul not only tells us that salvation is by faith, but also God's blessings come only by faith. Faith in God will not get you everything you may want. By the light of Scripture, not Scripture by the world. The New Living Translation uses waver. Other translations use doubt. The actual word there means to be divided. This doesn't mean we doubt whether God can do something, but we're wavering between seeking our own wants and seeking what God wants. If you pray for God to cleanse you from greed, but then you'd really like to have that new 4K television that your neighbor has, then you're wavering. Abraham wasn't a model person. God didn't call him a fine specimen of what a man should be and thus accounted him righteous. It was that Abraham's belief was not in himself. Instead, he had simple trust in God. And that's key number two. Have simple trust in God. Paul says in verse 20 that Abraham was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. It's another place to take a note if you want to. It's key number two. Abraham's faith was not in faith, but in God. He did not count on himself to bring about the promises of God. Well, actually, you know what? He tried once. It didn't work out well. Abraham learned to count on the fact that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he is going to do. It says Abraham was strengthened in faith. This means he exercised his faith and it grew stronger. It didn't start out strong, but as Abraham saw the evidence of God's hand at work, his faith was strengthened. I like the illustration of faith being like taffy. If you've ever watched taffy being stretched on a machine, it just seems like it can stretch and stretch forever. Our faith is a lot like that. The more our faith is stretched, the more of it we have. This enabled Abraham to act on his faith. And that's key number three. Act out your faith. Verse 21 says that Abraham was fully convinced that God could do that which he had promised. 
If you take notes again, draw an arrow to verse 21 and write key number three. Abraham was fully convinced or fully persuaded that God had the power and the ability to fulfill his promise. Abraham was assured by the evidence of God's actions. The Greek word translated there, it can mean filled up. In other words, God didn't just ask Abraham to believe, but assured him through the abundance of evidence. Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As you disregard circumstances, simply trust God and then act on that faith. God gives us an assurance that He can do it. Surrounding us all around in the world, we find sin and doubt. But surrounding us in the Lord, is a great cloud of witnesses like Abraham that dared to put their trust in God. How far did that trust go? Well, it was greatly tested when God called Abraham to sacrifice his promised heir. Abraham would have gone through with it believing that God would raise Isaac from the dead, but God stopped him. The point is, are we so fully persuaded that even if it seems our promise is leaving us, we will still trust God? So the final key, key number four, is trust God no matter what. Trust God no matter what. Are you willing to trust God through every circumstance and every situation? Are you willing to trust God with your finances, with your family, with your career, with your future? Are you trying to hold on to some of it, or perhaps all of it, for yourself? What are you willing to let go of for God? And we're, we're quickly approaching this new year. But before we get there, we will have a season of thanksgiving, a season of giving. Both Thanksgiving and Christmas come and go. But in this new year, what if we committed ourselves to the giving of thanks and to trusting in God's promises?